there's more than one reason to celebrate. Let's go on a journey. And count the way as we take you to experience a different side of the world's cultures. Adventure awaits on Festivals of the World. Koning's Da. Let's go to Western Europe to the Kingdom of Netherlands for the King's birthday. That's right. Koningsda means King's Day and is a national holiday commemorating the birthday of King Willem Alexander, the current monarch of the Netherlands, every April 27. Before the reign of the king, it was called Koninginada or Queen's Day because the previous monarchs were women. It is still unsure at present if this holiday would still be called Koningsda or if the holiday would be changed back to Koninginada. If the king's heir apparent, the Princess of Orange, takes over the Dutch throne. Although this special holiday was first observed in 1885, only four Dutch monarchs, including King Willem Alexander, have had this holiday dedicated for them, and the date would vary if there would be a new king or queen unless the previous dates will be retained. And on Koningsda, the entire country will be bursting with the color orange. Why orange? 1. Because it's the color of the Dutch royal family. And 2. It's a bright, happy color, and it's a good color to symbolize the end of dull gray winter, which is why it's a good thing that the king's birthday fell on April. What the Dutch royal family does is visit a city or two in any part of the Netherlands that varies every year. Thus, the chosen city becomes extra special when it's their turn to be visited by the royal family. But let's get to the fun part. It's said that the Dutch are known to be one of the most enthusiastic people in the world when it comes to festivals and parties. Surely having Koningsda is a treat, especially when you're at the capital city, Amsterdam. Spontaneous is the name of the game in this city. Koningsda is the one time where the police are not allowed to break the chaotic festivities, unless of course something bad happens. But that's highly unlikely, because there aren't really many crimes in the country. So people are taking advantage of this day to set themselves loose. The most popular thing about Koningsda, aside from the fact that it's the king's birthday, the flea market or in Dutch, Vremarkt. On Koningsda, anyone could sell stuff, even the ones which have been stored in people's houses for years, without having to acquire a permit, just as long as they're not items banned in the Netherlands. On the average, Anyone who sells during Koningsda gains a profit of about 90 euros, so it's understandable why everyone wants to sell things. The Vreemarkt is also your knight in shining armor if you forgot to bring orange clothes because you'd be able to buy all sorts of clothing you can imagine. Orange wigs, orange dresses, orange boas, orange neckties, even orange tutus. If you come to the Vreemarkt, you'd be able to blend in and finally be one with the Dutch in the festivities. There are also many concerts and special events all around Amsterdam, so if you're in for some music, you could drop by some places in the city like Museumplein or Rembrandtplein. You'll find your way to the party. Just follow the biggest bunch of people in orange and you'll be good. But if you prefer doing something chill, you could go to Vondel Park and, well, chill out. Amsterdam is a gift by the transportation gods because you could go around the city through many different options like bikes, canal boats, and electric railways. If you really have your heart set on fitting in and you think that wearing orange isn't enough, 
here's what you can do. Familiarize or memorize the 1574 poem called Het Wilhelmus. It's about the life of William of Orange and his heroic deeds for the Dutch people. People randomly sing this piece during Koningsdag. That's why it'll come in handy knowing about it. Koningsdag isn't about the royal family or deep sense of patriotism. It's the one day that the entire Netherlands is in the same page and everyone belonged. So if you want to know what the sense of belonging feels like, you know when and where to go. Outside Lands It's time to travel to the West Coast for yet another festivity for music and art. Let's go to sunny California in one of its most popular cities, San Francisco, for the Outside Lands Music and Arts Festival. The festival has been held at Golden Gate Park since its first edition in 2008. And no, the park is not at the Golden Gate Bridge, but if it's any consolation, the iconic bridge is just nearby the Outside Lands venue. Outside Lands prides itself for its superb and eclectic lineup of artists and prominent musicians have been headline acts during its previous editions. There are lots of indie rock and alternative rock bands you should look out for. There are also musicians and artists that specialize in the genres popular today like electronica and hip-hop or rap music. It'll be difficult to see all the shows you want to attend to but they have a nice app that'll help you organize your festival schedule. Don't try to take it all in. You'd be running out of energy for the next days. Food may not be included in Outside Land's full and official name, but that is what rivals music's popularity at this festival. Sure, you have your typical festival food like pizza and fries, but Outside Land has brought exotic foods coming from different parts of the world. So while others are busy making a list of which artists they should wait for, another portion of the festival goers are making a list of which foods they are going to try. It's a refreshing feeling to escape the music for a while. But if you're another kind of human being who is not too inclined to music nor food, there are displays of artworks in some tent setups at the festival grounds that you could check out. There are four primary stages in the festival, so you would walk a lot if you're anticipating many different artists. Their app is really useful. It could help you with your way around the park. Aside from the stages, there is also a comedy tent and DJ tent. Explore other interactive tents. You'd have extra fun if you only didn't jam and party to the music. There are wineries that offer samples in one area of the festival grounds, but just because adult drinks are allowed in the festival, it doesn't mean that you're going to abuse that liberty. Be a responsible human being, and wouldn't you love it if you remembered almost everything that happened at the festival? Instead of being knocked out cold for several hours and at the mercy of your prankster friends or strangers because you chose not to be a responsible grown-up, a few sips of the delicious wine will do. Even the city's weather has its mood swings, so make sure to pack extra layers of clothes in case it suddenly gets cold. Wear something comfortable, because seriously, you're going to get beat from all the walking. You could also bring a blanket so that you can sit on the greenery of the park when you want to relax for a while. It's a good thing that Golden Gate Park is a beautiful place. You can see huge green spaces and the prominent structures and buildings. Who says you can't wander off the festivities to check out the Golden Gate Park attractions? No one! So get going and visit some interesting places like the Botanical Garden, the AIDS Memorial Grove, California Academy of Sciences, the Conservatory of Flowers, the Japanese Tea Garden, and the Dayong Museum. If you're in San Francisco on a non-outside land season, 
you could come back so that you'd be able to appreciate the park better. Sadly, Outside Lands is not a camping festival, even though it's a three-day event, so you'd have to find accommodations on hotels nearby. Outside Lands has lots of partnerships with various hotels in San Francisco. You could check those out. Anyway, if you still have extra energy left after the festival day, you could explore San Francisco, or if not, hang around the city first after the festival. Take the opportunity to take your postcard-worthy photo of the Golden Gate Bridge. Outside Lands Festival is held annually in August in varying dates. Check out their announcements regarding the next festival edition. See you in San Francisco! Semana Santa Any country whose primary religion is Christianity observes Semana Santa or Holy Week. It's the last week of Lenten season and this time is popular for the reenactment of the Passion of the Christ, which happens on Good Friday. Sorry for bursting happy bubbles, but this holiday isn't a happy one. But hey, if it's Semana Santa already, it means Easter is next so you don't really have to be solemn for a long time. The most significant Semana Santa observers can be found in Spain. But to be more specific, in the region of Andalusia, where its capital city Seville considers this week to be the most important period of the year. Instead of going through all countries who observe Semana Santa, we'll be focusing on two cities, Seville in Spain and Antigua in Guatemala. Let's go to Seville first. In the city of Seville, the Holy Week is one of the highlights of their year. That's why Semana Santa here is one of the grandest in the world. You will see huge and elaborate floats during the procession, depicting Jesus and other figures included in the Passion. This float is called Paso, and there are going to be lots of those in Seville. The Pasos dedicated to Jesus use wood, wax, and wire to build their figures, which are usually covered in gold, that depict scenes from the Passion. On the other hand, the Pasos for the Virgin Mary are often covered in silver and depict Mary crying for Jesus. Think of La Pieta. The Pasos are lavishly and grandly decorated, definitely beautiful sights to see and disappointing to miss. When these lavish floats pass by, they are accompanied by the sound of coronets and drums and you probably wouldn't recognize. But underneath the splendidness of the floats are the costaleros. About 40 costaleros carry the float on their shoulders and control the pasos swaying and shaking. If you see people wearing all white, tall cone-shaped hoods with masks which only have holes for their eyes and have a mark called capirote and long-sleeved and ankle-length clothes, those will be Nazarenos and definitely not the Ku Klux Klan or some cult. The colors worn by the Nazarenos differ depending on the city or town, but several usually uses the color white. The Nazarenos are almost entirely covered because they could repent for their sins without getting recognized by anyone, so that they don't have to be judged or be ashamed of being self-confessed sinners and they could repent in peace. The Nazarenos precede the huge pasos and they carry long wax candles, marching in silence. There are also the penitentes, also wearing white habit and the hood of the brotherhood, but without the hoods, they are not pointy and are carrying wooden crosses, making public penance. In Antigua, Guatemala, the color counterpart of the white-clad people is purple. The purple-clad people in Antigua wear the same pointy hat, mask that only has eye holes, and long-sleeved, ankle-length clothes are also repenting for their sins. And they are called cucurochos because in Spanish, cucurocho means cone, and it's probably because of the hats. They also chose the color purple to serve as a symbol of penitence, and the entire procession embodies collective sorrow and regret for their sins. Antigua has three main activities during Semana Santa. 
the procession of floats? Just like in Seville, but unlike in Seville, Antigua has horses during the procession, the carpet making, and the candlelight vigils. They also depict the Passion, the last days of Jesus Christ's life. The floats showing Jesus carrying the cross are carried around by the cucurochos. You would be able to figure out the route of the procession if you see the sophisticated looking carpets laid out on the streets. These fancy carpets have been designed years ago and have undergone several generations of designers. They are made of natural materials like flowers, fruits and pines and are dyed in a bursting variety of colors. Some flowers are woven into the designs themselves. You don't have to be Catholic to be able to pay respects, you just have to be sincere. It's a good feeling having to be nice for a week. You'll understand when you witness Semana Santa in these cities. Edinburgh Festival Fringe We're going to the UK. But sorry, the destination is not in London, nor in any part of England. We're going to Scotland instead, and head to its capital, Edinburgh, for the Edinburgh Festival that takes place mostly in August. The Edinburgh Festival is a collective term for the many festivals going on in the Scottish capital, facilitated by various organizers, unrelated to each other, but all dedicated to the arts and culture. While each and every festival is worth attending, because it's about culture and arts, we'll be focusing on one of the most famous festivals, the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, also called the Edinburgh Fringe or simply the Fringe. Now why does the Fringe stand out among the rest? It's the largest festivity in the Edinburgh Festival and the largest arts festival in the world. It ousted the original and official Edinburgh Festival called the Edinburgh International Festival, or EIF, in terms of popularity. Its beginnings are very rebel-like, and you're going to be amazed at how the festival gained its current sort of Queen Bee status. It happened in 1947, just after World War II. The EIF was established in order for the human spirit to bloom because the war and its consequences left people scarred. Then on the same year, when the EIF was taking place, eight theatrical companies organized their own event just outside the premises of the EIF, giving an alternative to established theatrical companies. These rogue performances gathered together and it became an annual thing. That became the Edinburgh Fringe. The name came from a playwright critic, Robert Camp, and what do you know, it became even more popular than the original one. Pretty cool, isn't it? The Fringe is not the largest arts festival in the world for nothing. Of course, the festival upholds a classy, sophisticated feel, but over the years, it became more open and broader. Production aesthetics and Edinburgh Fringe have pretty high standards, and comedic performances often have a performative side and is usually the dry UK brand of humor. Legends like Dudley Moore and Peter Cook have performed in the Fringe, and comedy personalities like Steve Coogan and Ricky Gervais also have appeared in Edinburgh Fringe recently. The Fringe is known to catapult British comedians to fame because of its involvement in the Edinburgh Comedy Awards. That's why the comedy section is the most popular one. Besides, comedy is the most fun one, so why shouldn't it be popular? Other categories in the official Fringe program aside from comedy include drama, dance, circus, cabaret, children's shows, opera, musicals, exhibition, physical theater, and events. There have been adaptations of famous literary pieces such as stories and novels and reenactment of plays. Just so you know, if you have any talent in one of these aforementioned categories, you can perform. Edinburgh Fringe is an unjuried or open access festival, meaning there is no selection committee whatsoever. So if you're up for it, why not give it a shot? Who knows, you might be famous someday too.
Thanks to the No Selection Committee feature of the festival, there could also be some performances that have sensitive or controversial themes that would have been barred from a more traditional arts festival. Despite being a less conservative arts festival, the Fringe is still the Fringe. There may be high-profile performers to attract huge crowds. However, there would also be new, fresh, and young performers and companies before their big break comes. Some performance tickets may be expensive, but don't think the only good shows are the expensive ones. There are lots of cheap and free shows that you'll enjoy and worth checking out every year. Don't think that just because some performances are held in venues for the cultured, the streets would be left quiet. There are huge crowds surrounding talented street performers like bands, clowns, jugglers, magicians, and they're pretty good with what they're doing. There are so many things going on that this festival could last for three weeks. So soak up everything that you can while you can, because you know that when you leave, there's no art festival like Edinburgh Fringe. Watch the attitude! Festivals are usually events for people to have fun, so no horrible personalities are allowed. If you're naturally kind and friendly, you may go through, but if not, hold in that snarky, sarcastic beast inside of you if people are just in for a celebratory, harmless fun kind of mood. Remember, other people are also joining the festivities because they want to enjoy and have a good experience and you're not going to ruin that for them by bringing an unpleasant attitude in your luggage. Save that for really mean people. See what a typical chaotic festival looks like. There's a huge sea of people, so don't be angry if someone accidentally steps on your foot, notice you at your sides, or gets pushed. No one will get a proper sense of direction if the streets or festival grounds are all flocked with people, so lengthen your patience. After all, you're not going to tell the story about how you spent a day counting how many people stepped on your feet, are you? What you're going to remember is the music, the fresh new culture and traditions you've been anticipating for. Stick with that and you don't even have to remember the people who almost knocked you over. And usually, people are very kind during festivals, especially locals who are so willing to help out tourists. So is a scowl and a bunch of complaints a good way to return a nice warm smile? You don't have to be friends with people immediately, you just have to be polite and give them the kind of treatment they deserve. It may seem difficult to compromise, but hey, everyone wants a wonderful experience, not just you. And you'll have a better experience if you didn't have to get into a fight with anybody. So if you want to have a great time, better watch the attitude. Have fun and make friends. The celebration ends here, but the fun is not over. And we still have more festivities to look forward to. So recharge your energy and get ready for another adventure. We'll see you again on Festivals of the World.